All right, so welcome everyone to the Penn State College of Medicine, Understanding Primary Immunodeficiency. It's a Project ECHO Clinician Education Series, and we're delighted that you can join us again. My name is Jackie, I'm a member of the ECHO team. Um, I'll start us off with some quick announcements and introductions. Uh, my colleague, Jess, Jess is, um, Jesse's online as well. So if you have any questions or problems, you can reach out to either of us. If you're logged in with a name that we can't easily identify, we ask that you put your name and specialty into the chat for our record keeping purposes. If anybody's joining with you, please include their names in the chat again for our record keeping. We ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking, um, but feel free to unmute your microphone or use the chat for communicating throughout the session. Please remember that no personally identifiable information is allowed when we're discussing cases. We are recording these sessions <clears throat> for educational quality improvement purposes, and we share all materials after the session. In the spirit of Project Echoes, I'll teach, I'll learn. We're always on a first name basis during sessions. So today's session will include a brief talk on teamwork by um, Dr. Azar. And then during the presentation in case, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. We have a team of specialists online and they're going to help to field questions. Um, Colleen is actually going to share our case today. Um, but remember, this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can share both questions and answers. So I'm gonna ask our hub team to briefly introduce themselves, and then I'll turn things over for our speaker today. Um, Colleen, can I start with you? Yes, you may. Good, good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are. My name is Colleen Brock. I'm a registered nurse and manager of medical programs. I also have a PI and we have two young adult children with a PI and I welcome everyone here today. Thank you. And in no particular order, I'm just going down my list. Um, Megan. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Messick, and I'm the Director of Education at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Excited to join you all this afternoon. Thank you. Ken. Good morning to y'all. I'm Ken Bass from Texas. I'm a patient with common variable immunodeficiency. I also work with IDF as a support group leader for others with primary immune disease. Thank you. Um, Diana. Hi, my name is Diana, and I am the mother of a child with PI. Thank you. Paula. Hi, I'm Paula now. I'm a faculty um, primary immunodeficiency specialist and um, allergist at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Wanted to also give a welcome to um, Dr. Antoine uh, Azar for his wonderful lecture today. Thank you. Alyssa. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa Kramer. I'm the Senior Director of Community Services at IDF, and I'm looking forward to this talk on teamwork. Very important. Thank you so much. And Antoine, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can introduce yourself and take us into our talk. Yes. Hi, everyone. Really a pleasure to be here. I'm Antoine Azar. I'm faculty in allergy and immunology at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I run an immunodeficiency uh, clinic. Uh, it's uh, primarily focused on uh, adult uh, patients with immunodeficiency. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to be here and, and talk to you about uh, this important topic, this important topic on teamwork. Uh, I, when you talk about teamwork, it's just uh, hard to put uh, a, a lot of uh, the slides together. Uh, so what I, I'd really like to do is that if you have questions, please feel free to, to jump in and interrupt. I think that's the purpose of, um, of these talks. Um, would you like me to just move the slides and get started? Can you guys see them? Okay. We, see cannot, this we cannot see them yet, so I'll let you know when we do. Oh, you cannot. Okay, let me uh, see how I can fix that. I stopped the share, so you just need to share again. Oh, you did? Okay, okay, here you go. So how about now? Getting there. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Okay, you can see the full slide, right? Okay, perfect. So, um, and that's working fine, right? Okay, great. Uh, so the, um, I don't want me to go through these closures, Jackie, no, I can skip those, Project Echo, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. So I, I would really like to start uh, with an important uh, part of immunodeficiency. Uh, I want to review how immunodeficiency disorders um, do present because we have a 
uh, the, the old, if you want, uh, thought is that immune deficiency presents uh, as uh, recurrent infections, but there's a variety of presentations that are really important to, to recognize. And then as part of, when we talk about teamwork, we're gonna talk about the multi-system manifestations of immunodeficiency. And I always tell my fellows and, and uh, physicians and patients that this is a multi-system disease. It can affect many, many organs and sometimes one organ before the other. And how we uh, use a team approach to uh, management of immunodeficiency. You may know this information, but it's really important to remember that primary immune deficiency, also called IEIs or inborn errors of immunity. There's a huge group of disorders that can cause a weak immune system. And in fact, any component of the immune system can become de defective or deficient and weak and result in immune deficiency. Uh, it's important to know that these are not rare disorders. It's estimated that the prevalence is about one in 1200 in the US. Uh, these are not rare. And selective IgA deficiency, which is the most common primary immune deficiency, affects about one in 500 individuals. However, most patients with the selective IgA deficiency do very well. Most patients are not even symptomatic. So this is a very mild form of immunodeficiency. There's been about 500 genes identified. And if you look at year after year, the number of genes that have been identified, the number of disorders of immunity continues to grow year after year. You can see on this graph, the number of inborn errors of immunity, especially over the past 10, 20 years, how many uh, have, have been uncovered uh, every year. And on the right side, you see the patients who are diagnosed with PI defects, they're also significantly on the rise. And this information from one of the IDF uh, uh, surveys looking at uh, the patients who are recognized, and a lot of it has to do with um, improved screening and recognition of the presentation of immunodeficiency, but also a lot of the agents and the biologics and the medications that are used that are uncovering uh, immunodeficiency defects. Um, there's a lot of still undiagnosed immunodeficiency patients. We estimate that uh, you know, about a half a million patients who are uh, uh, in the US are still uh, undiagnosed. And unfortunately, it's still taking a very long time to make a diagnosis, patients are presenting with multiple and recurrent infections and other manifestations and complications. And it's, um, you know, there's, I'm, I'm very appreciative that are a number of um, the patients and, and, and uh, family members here on, on, and I'm sure you may have had personal experience with taking a long time to get the diagnosis made finally. And on the right side, you see that a number of patients are hospitalized several times, two to five times, even 11 or 20 times or more before finally a diagnosis of immunodeficiency is made. Now, really, this is important to recognize that the manifestations of immunodeficiency is primarily infection, recurrent, unusual, frequent, complicated infections. However, primary immunodeficiency can also present very frequently with other manifestations, including autoimmune disease, people who have multiple autoimmune disorders, malignancy, inflammatory disorders, and you start to see why um, one physician alone uh, often is not uh, able or, or uh, is not optimal to manage all the complications that you have with immunodeficiency disorders. And, and uh, when we collaborate with a lot of other uh, faculty who are, who are uh, specialized in other areas of medicine, some of our closest collaborations are with uh, rheumatologists who treat autoimmune disease, uh, oncologists, and hematologists who treat lymphoproliferative disease. And that uh, connection and communication has become much more important uh, because primary immune deficiency, like I just mentioned, can manifest often as autoimmune disease, malignancy, lymphoproliferative disease. But at the same time, patients who do have autoimmune disease and malignancy are treated with agents that can cause an immunodeficiency disorder as well. And sometimes very hard to tell what came first. Did the person present with low immunoglobulins or a weak immune system, or was it the uh, rheumatoid arthritis or the vasculitis that was treated and then resulted in, a, in an immune deficiency? So that connection is very important. And many times it's difficult to know what came first, uh, and therefore specialists who are really experts in autoimmune disease and lymphoproliferative disease and neurological disease, they are they are a very important part of our team, very important collaborators, because they also need to understand uh, what an immune deficiency is and when it develops and how to deal with it. Uh, like I mentioned, there's a 
a large number of immunodeficiency disorders affecting any organ system, but the antibody deficiency disorders are by far the most common uh, uh, immunodeficiency disorders. Um, I believe Ken mentioned that uh, uh, you're diagnosed with CVID, which is an antibody deficiency disorder, which is by far the most uh, common, and especially in adults. And remember that um, immunodeficiency is a very often diagnosed in adults. In fact, 60 to 70% of patients with an immunodeficiency disorder uh, are adults. Uh, and that's also a common misconception that a lot of physicians say, well, if you're not born with it, you have not, not been sick as a child, then you cannot have an immunodeficiency, but that's not the case, right? Uh, you can get diagnosed with CVID at the age of, of 80, right? So it can occur at any age. And it's really important to highlight uh, the secondary causes of low immunoglobulins or hypogamma globulinemia. And that also highlights all these different uh, specialists in other areas who really need to be aware and attuned to the hypogamma globulinemia. Um, the, the, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Body, I put together a really nice uh, work group report on, on hypogamma globulinemia that I encourage you to look at. And it talks about all the secondary causes. Uh, hematological malignancies such as CLL, multiple myeloma, lymphoma can result in hypogam. Patients who have transplants, uh, a stem cell or solar organ transplant, uh, patients who lose protein in the urine or in the gastrointestinal tract, a patient who undergo protein removal for a variety of procedures, whether plasma exchange or immunoabsorption, which is part of the treatment for their autoimmune disease, and a large variety of medications and the number of medications that can cause immunodeficiency is significantly increasing year after year. There's been an explosion in the number of these medications used. And these are used for the treatment of inflammatory disease, uh, rheumatological conditions, neurological conditions, malignancy. Uh, so the, the, there's a large, I'm sorry, the slides keep advancing on their own. Uh, some really high uh, uh, entities uh, that are strongly associated with hypogamma globulinemia include uh, uh, vasculitis, ANCA-associated vasculitis, uh, EGPA, which is eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, um, juvenile arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus erythematosus. So we encourage rheumatologists every time they see a patient with these conditions to really check their immune system because there's a very high association. Same thing in neurology, multiple sclerosis and neuromyelitis optica disorders are also strongly associated with immunodeficiency. It's important again for our colleagues in neurology to check patients very early on when a diagnosis is made because that this is when they may uncover a, an immunodeficiency disorder. I'll briefly talk about SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency. This is the most severe form of immunodeficiency. It's a pediatric emergency. That's what, what the bubble boy had. And I'm sure you're familiar with um, every single the newborn in the US uh, is screened at birth for uh, possible skid. And if there's any abnormality on the screening that's done via a, a, a little um, a finger stick, uh, then they are referred immediately for further workup and treatment. Uh, patients cannot survive beyond several months if they're not recognized and treated. And that's why um, uh, early recognition is very important. These patients are born without T cells. T cells are the generals of the immune system. And if you don't have T cells, then uh, the, the, um, it's very hard to survive even uh, the, 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 any viral infection or any, uh, uh, any of the infections that, um, that you may get at this age. Uh, it's important to know that these patients may have very severe reactions to live vaccines because they're not able to process the live vaccines uh, like uh, somebody with a more immune system uh, does. So this disease, very severe, it's fatal if not treated very early. And usually the treatment involves uh, reconstitution, reconstituting the immune system, often via a, um, a stem cell transplant. CVID is the most common immunodeficiency. It affects about 125,000. It's the most common symptomatic primary immunodeficiency. And it's defined as a decreased serum IgG, decreased serum IgA and IgM, uh, and impaired production of antibodies in response to vaccines while excluding other causes of hypogam. Because CVID is the most common symptomatic, I wanted to spend a little more time and talk about uh, CVID uh, and some of its manifestations. And this diagram is, is for, I believe, from one of the IDF publications and just highlights the number of organs that can be affected. 
to talk about the variety of infections here on the left side. A lot of infection that can occur, including sinus infections, meningitis, with a variety of bacteria, streptomo, haemophilus, uh, pseudomonas, H. pylori infection in the GI tract, a lot of gastrointestinal infections with Giardia, C. diff, and a number of others. Septic arthritis, uh, uh, urea plasma and mycoplasma can cause septic arthritis and sepsis, so a variety of infections. But if you look at the right side, there's a variety of other manifestations that are not infections, these are inflammatory and autoimmune. And they're very common in these patients and important to recognize. And often patients would present with these manifestations first before even having infections. Chronic lung disease, including uh, lymphocytes and granulomatous inflammation in the lungs, a lot of lymph nodes, the splenomegaly, uh, inflammation of the liver with the granulomatous hepatitis, a lot of gastrointestinal disease like inflammatory bowel disease or a celiac uh, disease or uh, something called hypogammaglobinic sprue, which is similar to celiac disease, but it's not celiac, but it looks very similar to celiac. It's very severe, very difficult to treat. And a variety of autoimmune disease, about 10% of patients with CVID develop ITP or immune thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic anemia, Evans syndrome, rheumatoid. So this just shows you how many different organs are involved. And this shows you why it is very important for the patient to be uh, seen by a variety of providers who can work together to try to differentiate what is what and how to treat these conditions. A lot of these conditions that you see on the right are often treated with immunosuppressive therapy. And using immunosuppressive therapy in somebody with CVID can be complicated. So that's why you, you need a lot of put, put a lot of heads together to be able to, uh, to manage this the best way possible. Again, I want to highlight here in this cohort of 900 patients from the European Society of Immune Deficiency, about a third of patients develop pneumonia, but look at that, about a third or 30% develop autoimmune disease, splenomegaly, bronchiectasis, which is irreversible lung damage. About 25% of patients do develop bronchiectasis. Um, which, which has to be uh, treated very aggressively as well and with the help of pulmonary colleagues. And uh, this is another um, uh, uh, slide to highlight the uh, uh, autoimmune disease in patients with primary immune deficiency. And on the right, you can see the relative risk of having cytopenia or hemolytic anemia in patients with immunodeficiency. If you look at that very high relative risk, rheumatological disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, the patient immunodeficiency are 40 times as high as a risk to develop rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, vasculitis. Um, so I, I just wanted in this, in this uh, uh, part to highlight um, uh, the, um, the, the importance of um, uh, uh, of the multi-system disease that these immunodeficiency disorders uh, present and how many organ uh, systems that can be uh, can be affected. And therefore, uh, having a quality healthcare team is, is essential uh, to be able to manage uh, all of these problems. Now, the, at the center of the, of the team always is the patient, is, the, is, is uh, you as a patient, uh, they're the most important person of this team and everybody else is here to, to be able to put their heads together and provide help. Um, but it's important to have healthcare providers who do understand primary immune deficiencies and how complex it is. Uh, understand the acute complications, understand the chronic complications, uh, the different management and how managing one thing can affect the other. Uh, and there's a lot of room uh, for a lot of us to be educated and primary care physicians to be educated on immunodeficiency. Um, uh, for, obviously, the IDF has done an excellent job in trying to, to just spread more knowledge about this to understand what these disorders are, because as I mentioned, they're not uncommon at all. Um, it's, it's important to find an immunologist who does specialize in immunodeficiency disorders. Uh, these, uh, a lot of allergy and immunology physicians, they may not, uh, they may not uh, see a lot of patients with immunodeficiency. It may not be their main specialty. They may specialize in a lot of other areas in allergy and immunology. But somebody who, who does see immunodeficiency patients who specialize in immunodeficiency and who can be a partner for, for the patient and, and somebody that you're comfortable with. And, and if you're not comfortable with the physician that you see, uh, then you should uh, uh, mention this to them or, uh, or explore and look for, uh, for other physicians that you would really would, would feel comfortable with as your partner. Uh, it, it, that's, uh, that's always important that individuals who are very involved in their own healthcare decisions 
tend to do better. And although uh, I, I don't know if I have this as a next, yeah, but providers always should be welcome in encouraging the patient's question and input. And I tell my patients, we can be very busy as healthcare providers. Healthcare has become, not becomes always been very complicated, very crunched on time. However, uh, most providers do appreciate when a patient comes in and they've they're curious, they have questions, they've done their research, they looked at, you know, but why is this, uh, uh, why are my labs are like this? What does this mean? And uh, that's, uh, I, I don't think there's any physician would not really welcome uh, having a, uh, a, a discussion, answer questions uh, uh, when uh, when somebody is really um, trying to, to find, um, uh, find answers to things that are really complicated. And uh, uh, many times uh, patients ask me, uh, they've done an online search or Google search, and there's there's a lot of information that can be very confusing uh, online. You know, IgG, uh, if you research that, it can be, it, 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 uh, it can be uh, associated with cancer. A lot of patients ask me, does this mean that I have cancer if my IgG is low? So it's important to come up with all these questions and be able to, um, uh, to discuss them with your provider. And the IDF does have on their website a link uh, to find um, specialists uh, depending on your area and your zip code. Um, there was a study that I did not show here. Um, I, I believe it was done in Louisiana. It, it looked at the number of uh, providers that the patient with immunodeficiency uh, is, um, is, is needing to see. And there was like, 17 different specialties uh, that the patient with immunodeficiency, like on, on average, that patients uh, uh, had to see because of the number of complexities that they have. But you as a patient, you, uh, you're at the center of this team. And then the primary care physician uh, is the main role for the primary care doc will be to, be address, uh, to address all the uh, concerns, all the acute concerns that are going on. Somebody who's very close to you geographically would be optimal. And somebody would be able to really coordinate care across all the multiple specialty. We mentioned the important role of an immunologist in making an appropriate diagnosis and treatment. Uh, diagnosis is complicated with immunodeficiency, and a lot of um, the times it's not simple. You may need to do labs, but to do some vaccine challenges and interpreting uh, the results may not be straightforward. If you ask a number of immunologists how to interpret the results, sometimes they may not even agree on that. Um, uh, on this side, it's really important, and many times there is misdiagnosis, either an underdiagnosis or overdiagnosis of an immunodeficiency disorder. And the immunologist will really um, set up the main treatment strategy for the immunodeficiency, whether uh, it's immunoglobulin therapy or transplant or antibiotics or the use of immunomodulatory agents. They will set up like the long term plan for how to treat the immunodeficiency. We work very closely with these number of specialists that I'm listing here on, on our list. We are in a, um, an, an, an allergen asthma center. We're right to next to our clinic. We have a pulmonologist. Uh, the other clinic is rheumatology and otolaryngology. These are the three specialists I would say we, we share many, many, many patients with. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, about a third of patients do develop bronchiectasis. Uh, and having a pulmonologist who uh, uh, understands uh, lung disease, understands immune-mediated lung disease, how to treat bronchiectasis, how to treat the inflammatory uh, complications of CVID and other immune deficiencies is really important. And the pulmonologist will really help you when you need to get procedures done, such as bronchoscopy, uh, diagnostically, or pulmonary function tests. Um, a large number of our patients also see our uh, otolaryngologist, and we are maybe in a, in a nice situation, we have otolaryngologists who do specialize in sinus disease. That's what they do. Uh, and they are able to see people who have really complex sinus disease, chronic sinus disease, people have underwent, uh, underwent multiple surgeries. Um, another uh, uh, common complication of immune deficiency that don't talk about as much is, is hearing disorders. Uh, and we also have specialists who specialize in, in hearing disorders. Um, uh, an IDF survey showed that about 13% of patients do develop uh, hearing problems. And again, this is one of the permanent uh, conditions that results from uh, an immune deficiency disorder. Uh, and they will help with assessing hearing loss or tube placement. Rheumatologists, again, are very close collaborators, uh, both and goes both ways. Rheumatologists consults with us a lot when they have a uh, 
person with autoimmune disease where they want to treat them with immunosuppressive therapy, but they develop hypogam and they want to know how to manage that. And we consult with them a lot when we have somebody with an immune deficiency who develops an autoimmune disease. A gastroenterologist would be very, very uh, instrumental in treating the GI disease, which is very difficult to treat, obtaining endoscopies when necessary. A hematologist dealing with cytopenias, ITP, uh, uh, and, and transplant when, when this is necessary. Uh, we have a number of our patients who see nutritionists because of problems with malnutrition. Some patients may need to be on tube feeds. Uh, but more and more, we've been working with genetics as well. In the past uh, uh, several years, uh, the role of genetics in identifying and diagnosing immune deficiency disorder has become much more prevalent. It's much uh, uh, cheaper now to do a genetic screen, uh, whether a genetic panel or a whole exome panel. Uh, and uh, we have a very close uh, working relationship with geneticists. We see a number of our patients as well. Um, several of our patients need to see a psychiatrist or psychologist to deal with the, with the chronic uh, uh, complications of, of having chronic illness. And for a lot of children with, who develop behavior problems who are uh, help tremendously with the, uh, with a psychologist and physical occupational therapist who uh, help with physical rehab and exercise. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, uh, I'm going to, uh, to stop here and, um, uh, and I don't know, Colleen, if you have a case to discuss or other questions, but, uh, but the bottom line is you uh, patients at the center of this healthcare team that does involve primarily the patient who's at the center, uh, the primary care physician who's, who's, uh, uh, who's going to be your go-to person and your immunologist is going to develop your treatment strategy and treatment plan, but it takes the whole team of specialists for the for a large number of, um, uh, of people with immune deficiency. Okay, I'll stop here and we'll give it back to you. Thank you so much, Antoine. Um, this was absolutely excellent and um you know kind of trying to center us um with regards to how to how to build a team around these mm -hmm. highly complicated um diseases um i think i wanted to bring up um a question to sort of that sort of um, makes makes a point on how complicated these can be, and and maybe you can help us sort this uh, before we get to our formal case. But uh, one of my colleagues recently had um, a, a patient who they're currently seeing in the medical ICU, um, and she's a patient with multiple myeloma on an anti CD twenty drug um, called ocrelizumab. Um, so for, for our learners, uh, anti-CD20 drugs do wipe out um, B cells. Um, and um, the, the patient was found um, during their ICU stay after um, having been evaluated initially for parainfluenza. Um, and then she had difficulty clearing her parainfluenza, later on developed COVID, um, was still having positive antigen to COVID even six weeks out of her initial COVID in infection. And during her evaluation, they had, they obtained a flow cytometry and noted that not only were her B cells zero, um, but her T cells were also significantly depressed with her CD4 helper cells being less than 50. And so I guess my question, um, and, and currently she has a little bit more of a complication with an organizing pneumonia that's being evaluated for a potential fungal infection. And here's where we go to what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of scenario and building all of the team together. Um, and where maybe our colleagues in rheumatology and neurology and primary care providers, sometimes it's helpful um, to get some of these antibodies checked um, or these uh, a flow cytometry or at least an IgG at baseline before starting um, certain types of medications to know whether it was the uh, chicken or the egg. Um, and the reason for that is like currently, um, one we don't know was she does she have a primary immunodeficiency or if this is secondary to the um ocrelizumab um and also um 
she has had significant benefit with the ocrelizumab to her multiple sclerosis. And so she's very um, upset and angry at the possibility of having to stop that because her MS was so debilitating until she started this medication. So I wanted to get your input, Antoine, is, um, you know, what, what has been your experience uh, with this? Have you found any of these medications acquired? Um, um, immunodeficiency can get very complicated. And have you seen with uh, this particular medication it affecting T cells in addition to B cells? And do you think it's reasonable to stop the medication or is it possible to continue? Paula, thank you so much for presenting uh, and talking about this uh, this patient and just definitely reflects the uh, the complexity that we're talking about that you have a... and I'm. Uh, well, I think you, you mentioned multiple myeloma at the beginning, but you said multiple, is it MS? Oh, it's multiple sclerosis. I apologize. Oh, that was no, a okay. misspoke. It's multiple that's sclerosis. Okay. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. And and uh, just one more question. Does, did this patient ever get immunoglobulin levels checked? Not before, unfortunately. So it's one of those cases where uh, nothing was checked before. It, immunoglobulins were checked now, and they're essentially all undetectable, right? Because their B cells are zero. Yeah, yeah. No, this is uh, it, uh, you're you're highlighting in several things that that uh, I've talked about uh, and tried to allude to in this slide. So the first thing is uh, multiple sclerosis is one of these conditions I mentioned earlier that is highly associated with hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, we don't understand very well, like you said, where's the chicken or the egg and what started first and what were her immunoglobulins before. But the first thing is that's really important is uh, to teach uh, 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 specialists and other specialties in neurology and rheumatology to really check these immunoglobulin levels before starting anti-CD20 medications such as ocrelizumab. Um, I will, I will uh, 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 put a side note here that's, that's uh, one nice thing about ocrelizumab as compared to the other anti-CD20 antibodies like rituximab. Uh, I believe that the, in, the, in the package insert of ocrelizumab, it does state to check immunoglobulins before using it. So I've seen more neurologists do that uh, as opposed to other uh, conditions or other anti-CD20 antibodies, which uh, I, I talked to a group of neurologists recently. Said, yeah, we, we're doing that because it's, 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 it sits there. It's mentioned there in the, you know, check immunoglobulin levels. But that's essential because now that you're seeing this patient without B cells and without immunoglobulins, you're trying to understand that this all a secondary process because of the treatment of multiple sclerosis, or it is something that's uh, that's been going on for a long time. Uh, the other thing, uh, important thing, so ocrelizumab gets rid of the B cells. Another question: Why does the patient have low T cells? And uh, one of the main questions I would ask is: uh, Has the patient received in the past? several months, any other treatment that can target the T cell. There's a variety of treatments for MS, uh, and many of them can do, uh, do affect the T cells significantly and bring them now and bring the C4 count to below uh, 100. And I've seen a number of patients who have received uh, several MS medications who, even when we stopped them, their CD4 count remained low for, for a long time, for a year or two, even after stopping the medication. So what this patient recently on, uh, uh, steroids or any of the other agents that uh, that that target uh, uh, more the T cells, but now yes, you are in the situation where uh, where you 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 do need to have this uh, definitely this team approach and talk to the neurologist about this patient. Obviously, the patient in the ICU as well. You have you have the infectious disease who's involved. You have the neurologist who's involved. You have the ICU attending who's involved. Probably a pulmonologist as well. Could they probably going to try to find out what infection she, she has in her lungs and do a bronchoscopy? Um, in terms of what what do you do? Uh, she's really better. That's that's the complexity of these immune disorders. She's really benefited. MS is a horrible disease, especially it's one of these progressive MS. Um, you're in a situation where the patient did benefit clinically, but now obviously the patient developed a complication from being immunocompromised. So this is a difficult decision to make if you don't treat the MS or the vasculitis or the uh, inflammatory bowel disease, then you're going to have problems with the MS. But if you treat it, you're going to have these complications. Uh, so my approach would be, again, the best part of it, we're talking about teamwork, we're talking about the, the, the neurologist and the other team members and the infectious disease doc. And um, the, 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 then everybody should sit together and make that decision. Um, immunosuppressive therapy has been very important and helpful 
um, what is the risk and benefit of holding that for a while, maybe, uh, I don't know how often it's getting ocrelizumab, but maybe holding it for a few months, allowing the immune system to recover, is there a significant risk with doing that? Are there any other medications uh, for MS, because many patients are treated with a number of medications that the patient is being treated with uh, that can be reduced, use the, use the minimum dose of immunosuppressive medication possible. For example, if the patient is concomitantly on steroids or other medications, can these be uh, reduced or minimized as much as possible? Um, and if the answer is no, and the patient absolutely has to be on ocrelizumab, uh, then uh, the, the, um, what, what your role as an immunologist can be is, well, maybe we can supplement this patient with immunoglobulin therapy and replace those immunoglobulins if, if the IgG level is very low and the patient obviously has an infection and a severe infection, that the, 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 the least thing to do is try to fix that problem and replace the immunoglobulins that the patient doesn't, uh, is not able to make. And that, as an immunologist, can really help them say, you know, I, I can give them polyclonal immunoglobulins, we can bring IgG back to normal, knowing that this will not, the type of infection she has is going to be key. If she has pneumocystis pneumonia, for example, IVIG is not going to help much with that. But if the patient is having bacterial and viral pneumonias, like you mentioned, she had a viral infection, then there's a good chance that immunoglobulin therapy can help do that. And you can supplement her with immunoglobulins while continuing her therapy. I'm sorry, this was a little bit of long answer, uh, but that's that reflects the complexity of the decision that you have to make. I, I love that. Thank you so much, Antoine. I appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you. That was perfect. Jackie, if you want to share the slides, we will talk about. Can you see them? Yes, perfect. So we're going to keep going with this communication perspective and how if somebody has a PI and they have several different physicians, clinicians who are working with them, who's running the team and how is the team talking to each other? So we're going to look for advice on how would this person's immunologist work with their pediatrician and pulmonologist? And, and I also want you to think about it in reverse. How, if I am the immunologist, how am I working with this person's pediatrician and pulmonologist? So kind of in, in, both perspectives. If I'm the pediatrician, how am I reaching out? If I'm the pulmonologist, the same thing. When, how, all those kinds of things. So that's what we're going to focus on. So this is an 11 year old female. She lives with her parents and a younger sibling. They, she has received all her vaccines and no supplements. At three years of age, she began having recurrent upper and lower respiratory tract infections. She has a decreased IgG, IgM, Ig2, Ig3 of the subclasses and the CD19 lymphocytes. She has an inhibited granulocytes, decreased levels of anti-HB titers, negative for elevated serum specific IgE. So she was diagnosed with hypogammaglobulinemia and some cellular immunity disorders. She was placed on Ig therapy. She got monthly transfusions, reduced incidence of infections. However, they're starting to increase now. She has also developed a chronic cough. Asthma has been ruled out versus spirom via spirometry and skin prick assessment. Antibiotics are not always required for respiratory infections, but she does occasionally develop pneumonia and obstructive bronchitis. So there's, there's a couple things with that. If you can go back real quick, Jackie, one slide. So I want to focus on a couple things in that this 11-year-old girl is coming in. She's been on therapy. And she's been doing well, but now she's starting to have an increase of infections. Why? And what can anybody do to help her? And then looking at the respiratory infections, obviously somebody on immune replacement is not going to never get sick, but it seems that her infection rate is increasing. So 
let's take it from the immunologist perspective. So Antoine, if you're seeing her, what would you do first to rule in, rule out whatever might be causing that increase of infection? Yeah, Colleen, thanks for uh, presenting and, and very relevant, this very relevant uh, to have a uh, to have a pediatrician, pulmonologist, and immunologist involved. My first, there's a number of questions I would have, but the first thing you want to do, like you mentioned, Colleen, immunoglobulin therapy um, does not eliminate uh, infections altogether, right? It significantly reduces respiratory infections, but they're not uh, eliminated altogether. Um, but the first thing I would want to do when I see a patient like this, um, even if the patient, even though the patient does have an immune deficiency, I want to understand what's her recurrent episodes of cough and bronchitis. Uh, are these all or most because of an infection? Uh, are these because of other causes uh, for cough? I know you mentioned a couple of workups that they've done. Uh, they looked at uh, the spirometry. Mm -hmm. Knowing that the spirometry PFTs, they don't completely rule out asthma, right? Because asthma can, even with non PFTs, you can still have manifestations, and you can uh, you can still have obstructive lung disease. Uh, are there any other other causes for cough, including um, uh, chronic lung disease? Has she developed bronchiectasis, which is definitely a serious complication, immunodeficiency? Uh, is it uh, 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 recurrent infections primarily? Is it something else? Is it related to uh, allergies? I know you mentioned uh, negative IgE is related to sinus disease. Sinus disease is uh, the, one of the most common complication immunodeficiencies. So we have cavities full of air. They're going to get easily filled with infection, and that can be one of the main triggers for cough as well. Or is it something else related to gastrointestinal disease or reflux? So understanding the cause of these recurrent illnesses is number one. And that's where, in my opinion, the role of the pediatrician is very important uh, in understanding, well, yeah, is this caused by this or this? What's the differential? So I, I want to understand that as a first step. Mm -hmm. I'll mention a couple of other things. Uh, the um, uh, What is also the nature of her immunodeficiency? Looks like she has low B cells, low immunoglobulins, but may have some cellular immunity problems as well. There may be some more investigation that can be done there in terms of how the T cell function is. Uh, if you look at the T cells and you put them in the lab and you stimulate them, are they working? And if the patient does have a combined immunodeficiency, this is somebody I would certainly pursue genetic uh, testing for uh, to, to see if there's any genetic cause for this combined immunodeficiency that can be targeted with therapy uh, in addition to or beside uh, IG therapy. So that would be, especially in somebody with a combined deficiency. And one more thing I'll say and, and uh, 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 is, is the immunoglobulin therapy. The main, uh, the main decision how to dose immunoglobulin therapy is how the patient is doing clinically. So if the pediatrician, pulmonologist, immunologist, everybody is convinced that we're really dealing with infections here, this, uh, although the patient may be on a good dose of immunoglobulin, there will be room to increase that dose. I don't know how much she's receiving, but that's one thing I would look at, uh, uh, check what her immunoglobulin level is, her trough level, and uh, there may be room to give her more supplementation to reduce her infection. So, so just... and, and that's great. That is, that is really good advice. And so if the pediatrician, as the immunologist, do you then contact her pediatrician and let him know kind of what you're doing and where you're going, where your thought process is. Do you talk to the pediat or the pulmonologist? So from an immunologist perspective, if you are sort of the team lead with that patient, are you relying on the patient to tell all their specialists what you're doing, what your thoughts are, what tests you're running, or do you do that? Uh, all of the above. Uh, I, I always ask the patients to be, to be in, I always explain all of this to the patient first, tell them this is what I'm thinking, this is what, uh, uh, what my differential is, uh, and these are my thoughts, like I want you to know what I'm thinking about, so we're all on the same page. The patient knows when they do visit their pediatrician or pulmonologist, they, are, they know what we're thinking. And then we have a communication with the pediatrician and the pulmonologist and telling them, hey, this is what we're thinking. That's our differential. I'm, I'm, are you sure? Because the, the, every time the, the, she's having a cough, she's seeing her pediatrician, she's not seeing me. 
So I'm not sure if these, if the pediatrician thinks that, oh yeah, these are, I'm very convinced it is a bacterial pneumonia every time. Uh, then mm -hmm. that's that's a very different category that tells you that, well, they should definitely be need to investigate the immune system further and maybe need to improve therapy. Maybe we need higher immunoglobulin dose. Uh, maybe we need prophylactic antibiotics. Maybe we need to evaluate with the CT chest to look for bronchiectasis and so on and so forth. But if the pediatrician tells me, oh no, you know what, she comes with this cough uh, and, um, uh, you know, she's having a lot of heartburn and every, every time she has the episode of cough, it's after she, you know, ate a certain kind of, I mean, so it's, uh, I think that conversation would be important to, to try to decide on when, uh, what, what to do next. And as a pediatrician, as the pulmonologist or any other specialist, at what point do they reach out to you as the immunologist? when they are treating that pa any patient, you know, when, when does this pediatrician reach out to you and say, Hey, this is what's going on. Or do they just treat until something really bad happens or they have a follow-up appointment with their immunologist? Yeah, I, I would say it, it, and, and, uh, in a, in a perfect setting, we'd have this communication open all the time In a real life setting, um, uh, the uh, uh, you typically after they see the patient uh, and they do their assessment, then we have this uh, communication. Usually, uh, uh, in in my area, um, maybe we're a little bit lucky where we are, but uh, physicians are very good at at reaching out and calling our clinic and calling us uh, and uh, and having a discussion. So whenever there's something that's not working well or there's a complication or something that we need to communicate and understand, um, that's that's the, I think that's the best way to communicate. We do send, uh, that's a problem with medical communication. We do send letters back and forth with a lot of details and we always do that because even having a phone conversation, sometimes you may not see what the labs are looking like, you may not see all the details and all the assessments. So we we make sure that every time we have patients come, uh, come to our clinic, we have them list their primary care physician and we look up their address and everything and every other specialist they'd like us to send a letter to and we make sure that the letter is sent to every single one of them so they have it in their file. And sometimes that's sufficient uh, communication, uh, but sometimes when uh, things are uh, not going well, but there's a number of, uh, of uh, uh, conditions uh, that are having this uh, uh, verbal communication is, is extremely helpful. I, I, I'll echo of what Antoine says. Um, and, and also, um, you know, reality is not always as, as good as what we want it to be. Um, at least from my perspective, just trying to be honest with, with my own practice. Um, and unfortunately, um, I do think there is a bias to ease of communication makes it easier for us to be better at it. Um, so if someone's within my own healthcare system, the ease of me being able to send a message and then like, oh, if I know the primary care provider um, and we have, they're in our system, I'm just going to be able to communicate with them in a much more easier way than if it's a primary care provider that's completely alienated from my system. Not that we don't make the attempt. Um, and as um, Antoine mentioned, every single time there's letters that I'm sending to all of the specialists, including the primary care provider. And then ideally when they see a patient, they send um, letters to me and that's our form of communication. But the question prompt question and answer, prompt ease of, like ease of, um, of communication on a patient does change, um, in, at least in my practice. Um, and I, and I, I wish it wasn't this way, but it does change between if it's someone within my own healthcare system, or if it's someone that I know and have worked with and have this long-term relationship with, um, the, the communication is, is, is much, much easier. Um, so I, I do think this is where, um, you know, having having a healthcare a connection with our pulmonologist. This is why I like have we 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 build these connections. So we're not just physicians and and thinking completely medically based. We also work on developing connections. So like the more I get to know many colleagues, many pulmonologists, many other immunologists. 
just um, that I can ask questions, that I can bounce things off, the, the better provider I can, I can be. It, it does unfortunately speak to the ease of connection if you were within the same system. So if we had a wonderful national health system where like our connectivity was easier, it might make things easier in terms of that communication. But in the absence of that, patient empowerment is going to be so important. So I love it when patients that have providers from all these different settings, like if they go to Hopkins and we're not connecting in the way that we should, um, and they bring all their notes, they have a binder, they have are able to be their own advocates in settings where I might not be able to reach the extra mile for them. I'd like to and that's great. And, and I and I agree with you. We have a couple of questions and we're we're running short on time. I think I want um, Antoine and Paula, if you agree, I think the biggest takeaway from communication is if that specialist has a question, they're not sure about a medication and how it affects the person's PI. If they're not sure how that person is doing, pick up the phone. Is that correct? pick up the phone and call the immunologist. I agree with that. I actually have no issues with people um, communicate. I love it when people communicate to me about their patient. I actually care about my patients. I want them to reach out to me. That's my pre personal preference. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, Colleen, I fully agree. Uh, and, and I fully agree with Paula also. The uh, Within our health system, communication is much easier. We can chat via the electronic medical record and have a number of five or 10, whatever people involved. I've had Zoom meetings on Sunday morning, something that's the only time I could meet with the urologist and the rheumatologist at the same time to be able to. So, but yes, much easier to do within within the health, the same health care system. I fully agree with that. It's more difficult when you don't have access to um, labs or results or notes uh, or, or providers from other institutions, but just having having a, a, when somebody calls, physician calls, we're always open for that. Um, that that's that's excellent communication, and we do it. Um, we do it uh, the, the, every time somebody somebody physician calls and talk about the patients. I like Paula said, I very much welcome that, um, especially when we're dealing with with complex patients. Much better to do it this way than have some. Um, Mm -hmm. confusion and a lack of clarity. So one of the questions in the oh, chat, oh, sorry, Paula. I was, is, I, yeah, I was going to answer, but go, go ahead, Colleen. Thank you. <laughs> what is, going back to the case that was presented, what is her tanner stage of development and could her hormones be affecting her immunity? I'm not sure about the tanner stage. Um, and then I'll let you address the hormones. I'm happy. To, I mean, I don't. I don't think that hormones will affect her immunity. However, if she's uh, one of the things I can think about, if she's growing and mm -hmm. her, her and and she's gaining weight, the IVIG is weight based therapy. And if she's been on the same dose for the last three years, there's a very good chance that she, she that she needs a much higher dose than she was receiving, and that may be one of the reasons she's not protected enough and she's getting infections. And having had two children that grow and grow and grow and grow and keep on going, I totally understand that. Their doses always went up. Um, another yeah, question. This is weight based. Hmm? Right. Do you consider CVID a diagnosis of exclusion or of exasperation? Is it is very difficult to diagnose? <laughs> I love Ken's laughing. <laughs> I don't I don't consider a CVID a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, there is very uh, diagnosis of exclusion really is when we rule everything else out and then it's just like that's that's the only thing that's that's left um cvid has very strict criteria so you could um that that, that need to be met that are agreed upon in general um and um you know, we it's not typically considered a diagnosis of exclusion you you fit into those criteria. I'd like to speak into it as a patient and say I really appreciated uh, Dr. Zar's comment about making sure that 
he's including other doctors that medical information needs to be sent to. Because as a patient, number one, I would hope that you would give me pertinent information about what this diagnosis is, because it could take two weeks, three weeks for me to see that other specialist. And we don't want to trust my memory. And, you know, I want to have something clear to give to the next doctor. And that's something that I think frustrates patients is how slow this process can move if it's only the patient that's moving all this along. And so direct contact from physicians or phone calls uh, certainly facilitates the patient's part in getting information to other people. Uh, trust me again, it frustrates us way more than frustrates patients as well. Uh, and many times I've tried forever to get records or labs from uh, different institutions. It's been, it was incredibly difficult uh, to, to just Get it from like somewhere usually out, outside our state. Uh, so, so that, yes, it's absolutely. Like Paula said it's not the communication is it, between different specialties is definitely not a not optimal the way it is right now. There's a lot of that, a lot more that that can be done. I mean, it's it's not something that we in this group are going to be able to change today. But there's something on the on the healthcare system overall. It's it's really too important to emphasize. Uh, how important that is and to facilitate being able to do it. But yeah, it frustrates us a lot when we cannot uh, get hold of somebody, we cannot get the information that we want or records or simple stuff as they were done or, uh, and it just can be, can be frustrating, yes, both to patients and physicians equally. To add to that, um, as the parent um, and speaking to other parents that uh, have children with multiple medical issues, um, whether it be, you know, immunology or whatever they have. Um, parents, uh, I always suggest you get yourself that binder. Like I told Paula, I go into every appointment. I write a summary that day. I put it in a file. I print it out. It's always on my phone. But that most important communication, and it can't be expected of every physician you know, I, I've seen our physicians text message the next physician um, and say, hey, what's up? Well, he's probably not going to get a response until 10 o'clock at night when his day is over. So we respect that. But um, with the use of portals these days and email, I draft that email per our visit today. This is what we discussed. This is what needs to be addressed. And I send it and we are in different health system services. So we're, I'm not in just one, um, one health system, we're in a few. And I message everybody and that way everybody is informed. And I'm not expecting them to memorize it, but they know that when we're coming in for an appointment, they can go back and they know, you know, this mom has emailed and it has made my job to advocate for my son so much easier, but also I think for the physicians that see him, they all go, oh, thank you. How many infections has he had? Well, I know exactly <laughs> how many, you know, you print off the list from Walgreens about what medications he's been on. Um, you go to the credo pharmacy and say what has changed, but informing your patients um, that Doctors are not um, going to know absolutely everything about you unless it's given. <laughs> is a it was like a wouldn't say a rude awakening, but it opened my eyes. I just thought that going into the doctor, you always knew. <laughs> the doctor knows. The doctor knows everything. Well, if it's not given to them, they don't always know, and that's the patient's job is and the the parent's job. So just to reiterate, um, as the- Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. I always love your comments. They're always so thoughtful and I actually learned so much from them. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we're closing in on the hour. I know we're very punctual here at Project Echo. Um, wanted to thank again um, Colleen for her incredible case that like brought so much uh, a conversation out of it. Um, all our participants and our hub leaders and Antoine, thank you so much uh, for, for everything. Mm -hmm. Wanted to quickly address uh, Karen Acevedo uh, made a comment on how does she get more information moving forward? Um, you know, uh, we addressed in, in the chat that there is a 
consulting immunologist program through the IDF. I'm always, um, will always be available by email. So you can certainly email me. I'll volunteer for that. Happy to answer any of your questions moving forward after this ECHO series ends um, and whenever moving forward. Um, and then just to summarize today, we had this incredible lecture on teamwork and really addressed how do we uh, further um, communicate with other providers in the real world setting uh, when we have a complicated patient um, that needs a lot of different care providers um, in the setting of complicated immunodeficiency. So thank you all for um, your wonderful uh, contributions today. Yep, thank you everyone. Please watch your email. You're going to receive an email that has a link to our session evaluation and also to our participant resources. If you're claiming CME credits, remember you must complete the evaluation in its entirety. If you're not claiming CME, we ask that you still do the evaluation. It helps us to continue to improve these sessions. And finally, we'll see you again on July 10th when we'll be talking about um, addressing social determinants of health. So please consider submitting a case for that discussion. And if not, we will see you on July 10th. Have a wonderful rest of your day.